Chris Neby. I'm the creator of the internationally acclaimed Mysterious China series, which documents the cultural heritage of China. What you see behind me is the famous Potala Palace in Lhasa, the capital of Tibet. Built over a thousand years ago, it used to be the seat of the Tubo Kingdom. The purpose of this documentary is to clarify the issue of Tibet as it relates to China. The film also documents the great socio-economic advances of Tibet, which have catapulted this once remote and impoverished region of Western China into the 21st century. Filming for years all over China, I have had the privilege to gain a comprehensive understanding of the complexity of this 5,000-year-old civilization. People in the West commonly idealize Tibet. Fascinated with this so-called place of mystery, many Westerners are often disappointed not to find a heavenly fantasy land in Tibet, but a society of real people with real problems like everywhere else. However, the Tibetan and Chinese cultures face particular challenges that are connected to rapid modernization that is in conflict with age-old traditions. The esoteric storybook image many Westerners come to expect about Tibet can be traced back to the international best-selling novel, Lost Horizon, written by British author James Hilton. Written in 1933, this critically acclaimed book inspired a Broadway musical, two popular movies, and a BBC TV series, all of which enchanted the Western world creating a spiritual utopia of Tibet as a mystic place of Shangri-La, the remote, idyllic hideaway where life approaches perfection. For there before us, shimmering in the sunlight, lay that mystifying, incomprehensible city of an unknown world, Shangri-La, legendary city of Tibet. It was an awesome and impressive sight. Shangri-La, who has not heard of it? of the strange tales that a few daring travelers have brought back from its mysterious depths. Of the Dai Lama, the living Buddha, who lives there secret and remote, revered and worshipped by the millions of Buddhists who populate the continent of Asia. However, the truth about Tibet's past and present is likely far different than most people have been led to believe. The Tibetan Autonomous Region roughly the size of Western Europe, is located on the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau, the highest region on Earth, also called the Roof of the World, with an average elevation of about 5,000 meters near the altitude of commercial airliners. Over Tibet's border with Nepal, the highest mountain in the world, the cloud-shrouded Mount Everest, looms about 8,850 meters or over 29,000 feet into the vast sky. Snowmelt from here and the rest of the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau forms life-giving rivers that have since ancient times been the lifeline of civilizations in India, Southeast Asia, and China. They are the Indus, the Brahmaputra, the Ganges, the Mekong, the Salween, the Irrawaddy, the Yangtze, and Yellow Rivers. Due to climate change and global warming, the glaciers that feed these rivers have been receding at an alarming rate. 
Scientists fear that eventually this will cause severe water shortages in the regions that depend on these rivers. Tibet is mountain locked on all four sides by the world's highest ranges. This remote isolation made Tibet mysterious, while the development of a religion based culture made it spiritually exotic. Tibet's isolation from the rest of the world helps to explain why for centuries this inhospitable region was not the main focus of Chinese geopolitics. In times gone by, Tibet was a nomadic tribal area. Ultimately, the tribes were united in an independent kingdom that later became a vassal under Chinese sovereignty and over centuries, Tibet evolved as an integral part of China. The general recorded history of Tibet begins with the rule of Songsten Gampo, who founded the Tibetan Tubo Kingdom. In 631 AD, he built the Potala Palace in Lhasa. In 640 AD, Songsten Gampo married Princess Wen Chung, a niece of the powerful Tang Emperor Tai Zong who wanted to ally Tibet with the Chinese Tang Dynasty. In the same way, intermarriage was widely practiced by European royalty to build many nations of ethnic and religious diversity. For example, the Austrian Habsburg monarchy, Scotland of the United Kingdom, and Bavaria of Germany. Over the next few centuries, the relationship between Tibet and China continued to evolve. In 822, a Tibetan king signed a treaty with the Tang Dynasty, which established a close alliance with China for the purposes of defense and trade. A bilingual account of this treaty was inscribed on a stone pillar, which still stands outside the time-honored Yokong Temple in Lhasa. Centuries later, Marco Polo, the famous Venetian explorer, journeyed across the roof of the world to the court of the emperor, Kublai Khan, the grandson of Genghis Khan and founder of the Yuan dynasty. Kublai Khan, one of the great unifiers in world history, consolidated control of China, appointing regional leaders of his choosing. In Tibet, he appointed the Lama Pax Pa, to the general council of the Yuan dynasty. The monk controlled Buddhism in China as well as administrative affairs in Tibet. His official seal is on display at the Tibet Museum in Lhasa. The 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries saw the rise of a Buddhist theocracy which was supported by the Yuan and Ming dynasties of China. Tibetan Buddhism dramatically diverged from all other Buddhist practices. It created a hierarchy of leadership based on the Indian caste system, where an extreme minority controls the vast majority. A Dalai Lama is effectively a living god in the society. Upon the passing of a Dalai Lama, the senior monks start the search for a soul boy, into whom the soul of a previous lama has settled, thus continuing the cycle. Such a soul boy is always discovered in a poor Tibetan family's home. There is a reason for this practice, dating back to the beginning of the Tibetan theocracy. If a soul boy were to be found in an aristocratic family, it could result in that family gaining too much dynastic power akin to the de Medici's, a powerful mercantile family of the Italian Renaissance that managed to also control the Vatican by having family members elected Pope. By not only controlling a large part of the economy, but also controlling the Catholic Church, the Medici's became a virtually untouchable force in Europe. Unlike the papacy, the Tibetan Dalai Lama is cultivated into his position from youth, until the soul boy reaches his mid-teens, when he can be elevated with grand ceremony to the position of Dalai Lama. One of the senior monks acts as regent. 
Thereafter, the Dalai Lama takes full control until his death. Let's take a step back to examine the roots of Tibetan Buddhism. Buddhism was introduced to Tibet in the 7th century AD and steadily grew in power over the next centuries until it culminated in an oppressive theocracy. Buddhism originated in India in the 5th century BC. The legendary founder is Siddhartha Gautama, who attained enlightenment while meditating under a Bodhi tree. Compared with Buddhism elsewhere in the world, Tibetan Buddhism is unparalleled in many ways and is much different from the popular Chan or Zen Buddhism as practiced in the rest of China. With Buddhism came the Indian caste system in all its demeaning form. Rigid laws divided Tibetans into three classes. Each class comprised three ranks. The first class included the Dalai Lama, senior monks, and the aristocracy. They had their lives valued in pure gold, equaling their body weight. They worshipped gold as sacred and considered it immortal. It was the only substance they knew that did not tarnish, fade, or corrode. The first class made up less than 5% of the Tibetans, but they were the ruling class, owning all the land, pastures, and forests, as well as the bulk of the livestock. The second class included lower-ranking monks, merchants, and officials. The third class was for manual laborers. Women, butchers, blacksmiths, hunters, herdsmen, and entertainers comprised the lowest rank in the third class. Their lives were valued equal to a rope of straw. 95% of Tibetans were slaves or serfs. For centuries, the majority of Tibetans suffered exploitation by the ruling class. All this was made possible through the complete subjugation derived from Tibetan Buddhism and accepted as a way of life. In the dungeons of the Potala Palace in Lhasa is an ominous museum, the Zol Jail. Here, in contrast to the peaceful Buddhist doctrine, some prisoners were subjected to extreme tortures. Among them, crushing fingers, removing eyes and limbs, as well as being flayed. In a number of documented cases, the condemned had their noses, arms, and hands severed or mutilated. The reasons for and origins of this torture are not very clear. Rather than look after prisoners, which was a cost to the ruling class, convicts were often shackled in irons and set out to roam the streets of Lhasa begging for food. The striking landscapes, dominated by forbidding mountains and the infinite sky, have had a profound effect on the indigenous Tibetans and their ancient religious belief of Bom, a spirituality deeply rooted in the shamanistic and animistic traditions of the Himalayas, a land of mystery with good and evil spirits. In a vicious power struggle for the hearts and minds of ordinary Tibetans, the Buddhist priesthood and aristocracy united in a ruthless theocracy, tried to marginalize Bon. Followers of Bon were severely oppressed and forced to convert to Buddhism. From time immemorial, the indigenous people of Tibet practiced Bon as their own indigenous religion. The newly established Tibetan Buddhism, the modern day version of which you are seeing now, could only succeed if it honored some of the ancient beliefs of the people. Therefore, Tibetan Buddhism, while oppressing Bon, adopted many of its characteristics and became much more extreme than the original Buddhism. By introducing the demeaning Indian caste system, which devalues human life for the majority of people, Tibetan Buddhism transferred the concept of sacrifice to its lowest castes rather than its highest priests. In short, Tibet is an extreme place, 
and people have embraced a lifestyle to match it. Religious practice is so deeply rooted in the Tibetan lives that prostrations and prayers are constant. Turning the prayer wheel is equivalent to reciting scripture and so pervasive that it defines daily life. Although rare, the millennia-old bom is still practiced in remote areas of the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau. For the next few minutes, we would like to immerse you in the ancient spirituality of Tibet, which has directly and indirectly defined life in the region. In the daily life of the villagers, deeply influenced by the hazy legends of sages, the shamans play an important role. Through hypnosis, witchcraft, blood rituals, and animal sacrifices, the shamans induce mystic fear and spiritual healing as they disperse their divine powers to the rhythm of sacred rattle drums. shaman purifies himself with a scorching iron to heal a patient. Tibetans have a long history of healing by using unorthodox methods, many including a show of mind over matter. These shamans wield hypnotic power and whip themselves and their followers into holy ecstasy. Villagers who have done bad deeds are singled out and humiliated in front of everyone, frothing from the mouth this frenzied shaman is separating the guilty from the innocent. Sacrificial piercing is spiritual cleansing for some and a show of bravery for others. For these boys, it is a rite of passage which they have anxiously awaited. Bone religion emphasizes animal sacrifices to satisfy the Almighty. The goats are first cleansed with milk and blessed before being sacrificed. By having made the blood sacrifice, the shamans are now empowered to bless their followers. Smoke rises from the ritual pyres and the ecstatic clamor of jubilant worshipers continues deep into the night. The auspicious fires burn past midnight when the mournful sound of the conch horns call the faithful to rest. There 
were nine different Buddhist sects in Tibet in ancient times. These sects competed fiercely for influence and privileges. Following bitter rivalry and strife, the Gelug sect emerged as the dominant force and affirmed its hold on Tibetans. Fully supported by the Ming Dynasty, which lasted from 1368 to 1644, the Gelug sect, also known as the Yellow Hats, continued to firmly establish their absolute political power and influence that lasts to this day. After the fall of the Ming Dynasty, the Gelug sect was also fully supported by the Qing Dynasty, which ruled China from 1644 to 1911. Further establishing China's integration of Tibet in 1727, the fifth Qing Dynasty Emperor, Yong Cheng, posted two high commissioners known as Ambans in Tibet. Through these positions, the Qing Dynasty controlled defense, foreign affairs, and finance. In 1791, after the Qing Dynasty quelled a British-backed Nepalese invasion of Tibet, the positions of the Ambans were reaffirmed. Only two years later, the Qing Dynasty issued the 29 Articles of Ordinance for the more efficient governing of Tibet. The rule of drawing lots from a golden urn to confirm the reincarnated soul boys was initiated. As a result, by 1793, the Qing Dynasty controlled the confirmation of the reincarnated soul boys of the Dalai Lamas, as well as Panchen Lamas, who are the second highest religious figures in Tibet, and the appointments of the Ambans, who controlled administration and defense. Up to this point, the integration of Tibet into China is quite clear and without contest. However, the next few centuries would be challenging for China due to the sudden interest of the West in monetizing the Asian continent, mainly India and China. The effects of Western conquest in Asia are an entire issue unto themselves, although parts of that story are very relevant to the understanding of Tibet and the amount of energy China could afford to devote to protecting its sovereignty over it. Ultimately, Britain managed to control parts of China until 1997, when it finally relinquished administration of Hong Kong. The next section of this film outlines how the past few centuries, riddled with foreign conquest and internal struggles, shaped the Western view of Tibet. This all culminates in 1913, when the disgruntled 13th Dalai Lama, supported by the British, proclaimed self-administration during a major transition in Chinese leadership. The context of this proclamation has often been skewed to make China's claim on the region seem unjust, but the truth is fairly clear once explained. It all began during the Qing Dynasty, when the British Empire, in an effort to retain its supremacy and control over the lucrative trade from Asia to the West, began a century-long campaign to separate Tibet from China. It is arguable that no greater injustice has been recorded than the treatment of China by colonial and imperialistic powers led by Great Britain during the 18th and 19th centuries. The most atrocious of these injustices were the two opium wars aimed at destabilizing the massive population of China. Known to mankind since prehistoric times, opium is the oldest and most widely used narcotic. Opium has always had an ambiguous reputation, on the one hand addictive and deadly, and on the other utilized extensively in medicine as a painkiller. Opium is the latex obtained from the opium poppy, which is frequently processed chemically to produce heroin for the illegal drug trade. The infamous opium wars were brought about by British imperialism, forcing China at gunpoint to import opium from then British India. In 1839, at the order of Lin Sheshu, the distinguished imperial envoy of the Qing dynasty, more than 1,000 tons of opium confiscated from British and American opium smugglers were destroyed on the beaches of Humen in Guangdong province. 
500 workers labored for 22 days in order to destroy the contraband, mixing the opium with lime and salt and dumping it into the South China Sea. Lin Sheshu also wrote an open letter to Queen Victoria of England, urging her to end the illegal opium trade, but his plea was ignored. Lin's anti-opium campaign was celebrated by the Chinese people, but was used by the British as an excuse to start the first opium war, which lasted from 1839 to 1842. After suffering defeat in the first opium war, China was forced to sign the Treaty of Nanjing, ceding Hong Kong to Great Britain, and open five treaty ports to British sovereignty, while the illegal opium trade continued. At the end of the Second Opium War, which lasted from 1856 to 1860, China was forced to open 11 more ports to Western control and legalize the opium trade that ruined the life of an entire population. Due to heavy drug addiction and war, millions of Chinese perished in this, the greatest genocide in history. At that time, the traffic in opium along with the African slave trade was the dirty underside of an evolving global trading economy. In America, as well as in Europe, most everything was deemed fair in the ruthless pursuit of profits. Karl Marx noted, Britain is seen a repetition of what happened on a gigantic scale in ancient Rome, a nation that enslaves other nations, forges its own chains. In order to demonstrate control over China, in 1860, Lord Elgin, the British commander of 18,000 British and French troops, ordered the torching and looting of the splendid and cherished Qing Emperor's summer palace in Beijing. Its burnt-out ruins can still be seen today. From India, then known as British Raj, the crown jewel of British imperialism for over a hundred years, efforts continued to separate Tibet from China. On March 20th, 1888, British forces launched an assault on Tibet forcing the Qing dynasty to sign a treaty in 1890 with Great Britain, opening the border town of Yadong as a British trading zone. Adding to the problems of the Qing dynasty and making Tibet a lower priority were the continued military aggressions of Meiji Imperial Japan, which culminated in the First Sino-Japanese War lasting from 1894 to 1895, and fought primarily over the control of Korea, which at that time was a vassal state of China. After more than six months of fighting, the Qing dynasty was forced to sign a ceasefire known as the Treaty of Shimonoseki. In this treaty, China had to recognize the independence of Korea and cede to Japan in perpetuity the Liaodong Peninsula, as well as Taiwan and the Penghu Islands. Imperial Japan also annexed the uninhabited Dayo Islands as war booty and incorporated them under its sovereignty, which is an issue playing out in Asian geopolitics today. Put in simpler terms, China was stuck in a chaotic cycle fending off imperial colonialism from many separate nations. Each had its own agenda, sometimes fighting one another, but none favored a unified China. British efforts to destabilize China continued well into the 20th century. In 1904, yet another British military expedition under the command of Colonel Francis Young Husband brutally invaded Tibet and reached Lhasa in an effort to gain control over the region. The Qing dynasty negotiated a truce through diplomacy using the Amban stationed in Lhasa. At that time, to avoid the British violence encroaching on Lhasa, the 13th Dalai Lama fled to Mongolia. 
In 1908, he returned to Tibet, only to flee again in 1910, this time to British India, his former enemy, after the Qing dynasty stripped him of control and sent its military to Tibet in an effort to once and for all expel foreign interests in the region. This, while necessary, created an enemy out of the dethroned 13th Dalai Lama. Within China, the humiliating defeat by Imperial Japan in the First Sino-Japanese War was a catalyst for political change. It was the inability of the Qing Dynasty to control the motherland that led to the birth of civil revolutions aimed at unifying China. The weakened Qing Dynasty continued to disintegrate during the Xinhai Revolution and finally collapsed after the Wuchang Uprising of 1911. Having ruled China since 1644, the Qing Dynasty was replaced by the Republic of China, which was formally established on January 1st, 1912. This ended over 2,000 years of imperial rule in China. The much-revered revolutionary Dr. Sun Yat-sen was the first president and founding father of the Republic of China. He had received his medical degree from the University of Hong Kong and traveled extensively in the West. Dr. Sun was married to Song Qinling, one of the three Song sisters, who were quite influential during China's modern history. There is a saying about these famous sisters, one loved power, one loved money, and one loved China. Dr. Sun's political philosophy is known as the three principles of the people, nationalism, democracy, and the people's livelihood. Dr. Sun passed away in 1925. His mausoleum is a testament to the great legacy he left behind. It is situated at the foot of Purple Mountain in Nanjing, the capital of Jiangsu province. After the founding of the Republic of China by Dr. Sun, the disgruntled 13th Dalai Lama returned from British India and was offered an olive branch by the new Chinese Republic. Rejecting the offer and encouraged by newfound British support, the 13th Dalai Lama proclaimed self-administration for Tibet. It is this moment that is the crux of any debate over Tibet's sovereignty. Even the British, who supported the Dalai Lama's self-administration, did not officially recognize the independence of Tibet. It is clear, looking back in time, that this was actually just an attempt at subterfuge. No country has ever recognized Tibet as an independent nation. No government, including the United Nations, has ever formally questioned China's sovereignty over Tibet. British India used the 13th Dalai Lama's desire for independence to negotiate the annexation of Chinese territory south of the Himalayas and further imbalance China's control of the region. This new boundary is known as the McMahon Line. The story begins in 1873 when the British-run government of India had drawn an arbitrary outer line intended as an international boundary between India and China. Both China and Tibet refused to recognize the annexation of this territory. Then, 40 years later, in 1914, representatives of Great Britain, the new Republic of China, and Tibet attended a conference in Simla of British India regarding this border dispute. However, this time, the 13th Dalai Lama had a different agenda. No agreement with China was reached about the so-called McMahon Line, named after the British diplomat Sir Henry McMahon, who was the chief negotiator at the conference. Despite this, the conference concluded with a treaty signed only by Great Britain and the delegates of the 13th Dalai Lama confirming the annexation of over 90,000 square kilometers of Chinese land by British India, now a major portion of the Indian province of Arunachal Pradesh. 
China rejected the Simla Accord, contending that the Tibetan government was not sovereign and therefore did not have the power to conclude treaties, which should be obvious, considering even Britain did not recognize Tibet as independent from China. Decades later, in October 1962, Chinese and Indian troops clashed at the McMahon Line. The war ended exactly one month later when China declared a ceasefire. To this date, the annexation of Chinese territory remains unresolved. After its founding in 1912, the young Republic of China for decades endured its warlord period, a civil war, and a brutal occupation by Imperial Japan from 1931 until 1945, putting the issue of Tibet on the proverbial back burner. To illustrate the severity of China's problems, allow us to visit the site of one of the most horrific atrocities committed during Imperial Japan's occupation of China, known as the Rape of Nanjing. It raged on for months, with over 300,000 civilians being savagely slaughtered. In commemoration, the Nanjing Massacre Memorial was built in 1985 on the grounds of the mass graves. Underneath these stones rest the remains of the slaughtered victims. To this day, no Japanese government has apologized to China for the war crimes of Imperial Japan. In 1949, Chairman Mao Zedong reunited China after decades of war and a brutal Japanese occupation. Meanwhile, the 13th Dalai Lama had passed away and the young 14th Dalai Lama had taken his place. As part of the reunification of China, the government of Mao Zedong formulated the 17-point agreement, a document reaffirming China's sovereignty over Tibet. On May 23, 1951, representatives of the 14th Dalai Lama signed the agreement in Beijing. This agreement was returned to Lhasa and followed by a telegram on October 24, 1951, from the 14th Dalai Lama to the central government in Beijing, indicating his enthusiastic acceptance. These words, written by the 14th Dalai Lama, clearly state his support for the agreement. The Tibet local government, as well as the ecclesiastic and secular people, unanimously support this agreement, and under the leadership of Chairman Mao and the Central People's Government, will actively support the People's Liberation Army in Tibet to consolidate national defense, drive out imperial influences from Tibet, and safeguard the unification of the territory and the sovereignty of the motherland. The Chinese government continued to respect the Tibetan theocracy under the leadership of the 14th Dalai Lama. With the mutual understanding, the Tibetan leadership would begin a transition away from feudal and oppressive practices. Both the Dalai Lama and the Panchen Lama were repeatedly honored guests of the central government in Beijing. Hadas, the long white silk scarves seen here, are the traditional Tibetan sign of welcome and respect. Both lamas were given a comprehensive tour of eastern China and granted rare access to top leadership. The 14th Dalai Lama was also appointed Deputy Chairman of the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress. However, the failure of the Tibetan theocracy to shift towards the central government's 
more progressive policies became problematic. As a result, eight years later, in 1959, encouraged and supported by separatist Western interests, namely the CIA, the senior monks and upper-class Tibetans challenged China's rule, resulting in an armed rebellion. The harsh retaliation of the central government during this period exacerbated tensions. This resulted in an unfavorable opinion in the Western media of China's sovereignty over Tibet, made possible by the fact that the Cold War CIA had already begun secretly collaborating with the Dalai Lama against China. This plaque is located at Camp Hale in Colorado, where ethnic Tibetans were trained for the rebellion against the Chinese. Eventually, the CIA aided the Dalai Lama in leaving Tibet for India and even arranged to have his so-called Escape from Red China's Tyranny filmed for use by Western media. Thereafter, the CIA funded the activities of the Dalai Lama for many years with millions of dollars. The individual members of the CIA believed in what they were doing, but simply put, the goal was to create problems for China, a country that the United States called an ally only a decade earlier. This film from 1944 reveals a completely different point of view than that presented in 1959. It was only 168 years ago that Washington crossed the Delaware. But more than 4,000 years ago, the Chinese Empire was already in existence. And more important, so was the Chinese civilization, a civilization of art and learning and peace. And China is also land. This vast area consists of China proper and four outer provinces. To the north is Manchuria. Next to Manchuria are Mongolia and Xinjiang. To the west is Tibet, the icy roof of the world, its borders encompassing the eastern end of the Himalayan mountains, the mystery land that few have entered. Yes, China is land, next to Russia, the largest country in the world. But most important, China is people, 450 million of them. Of every five persons on the face of the earth, one is a Chinese. And since one-fifth of all the human beings in the world are Chinese, we should know what sort of people they are. Well, in all their 4,000 years of continuous history, they have never waged a war of conquest. They're that sort of people. They developed the art of printing from movable type. They invented the mariner's compass, without which no ocean could be crossed. They were among the first astronomers, and their observations of the stars and planets made possible the accurate measuring and recording of time. They are that sort of people. And why do we call our dishes China? Because the Chinese invented the art of making porcelain. And as we all know, they invented gunpowder, not as a weapon of war, but to celebrate their holidays and religious festivals. And it was one of China's great philosophers who, 500 years before the birth of Christ, gave mankind these words. What you do not want done to yourself, do not do to others. They are that sort of people, enriching the world in which we live. Yes, China is incredibly old, incredibly big, incredibly populous. Yet it was until recently a land with which few of us concerned ourselves. But now a great change has taken place. China is now our fighting ally, or more accurately, we are China. For China has been fighting our enemy, Japan, for seven long years. By 1959, only 14 years after World War II, the United States completely changed its position on China, in fact, allying with Japan, and painted the picture of an aggressive Chinese regime oppressing the Tibetan people. It is notable 
that the common people of Tibet did not participate in this rebellion to any significant extent. When the revolt failed, the 23-year-old 14th Dalai Lama and his high-ranking entourage fled to India with the help of the CIA and set up the government of Tibet in exile at Dharamshala. It is at this point in time that, in the Western mind, the Dalai Lama became romanticized and associated with the utopia Shangri-La, as portrayed in the classic 1933 novel of James Hilton. This fueled the popular Free Tibet movement, which is the generally accepted Western understanding of the sensitive socio-political situation. The Dalai Lama reaches safety on Indian soil after a 14-day trek across the Himalayas, a fugitive from Red China's bloody repression of the Tibetan revolt. Now safe on Indian soil and free to speak his mind, the Dalai Lama charges that Beiping broke every promise to respect his country's independence and firmly denies red claims he left Tibet against his will. The Dalai Lama wrapped himself in the positive message of peace and harmony. The Western media continued to promote this image, but the exploitative nature of the Tibetan Buddhist theocracy has never been a point of discussion. In 1959, China once and for all abolished the Tibetan theocracy, as well as the caste system and its privileges of slavery and serfdom. Celebrating their newfound freedom, the liberated Tibetans enthusiastically burned their indenture and debt bondage documents. Extensive land reforms were enacted and former slaves and serfs became free men and successful farmers, tilling their own land and herding their own cattle. Life has changed beyond recognition in Tibet since 1959. Over the next few minutes, you will see the positive changes that have occurred over recent decades. Some that have posed unforeseen problems, but the overwhelming majority of which have offered opportunity and lifestyle changes unthinkable before 1959. The Chinese government adopted a series of far-reaching incentives and preferential financial policies toward Tibet. Chief among them, Tibetan farmers and herders are exempt from taxation. For as long as people can remember, Tibet had been dominated by subsistence farming. With little arable land, the raising of livestock was the primary occupation of most Tibetans. Now the economy has started to evolve beyond the raising of livestock, developing environmentally friendly agriculture. Assorted delicious organic fruits and vegetables are cultivated in extensive hothouse farms providing an environment never before possible due to the Himalayan rain shadow effect, which is the lack of any significant rainfall due to the dry winds that come from the mountain ranges of the West. The development of both agriculture and food processing industries have offered economic diversity, with food products making their way all over China. There are many rare herbs and wild plants on the plateau that are used in traditional Chinese medicine. The most precious of them is the caterpillar fungus, which is valued its weight in gold. The indigenous handicrafts of spinning, dyeing, and weaving of textiles and carpets have been transformed into successful industries. Here, in this rural area of Tibet, artisans handcraft carpets truly from scratch. Contributing 
to the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau's economic success are large deposits of zinc, copper, lead, lithium, boron, and salt. However, mining on the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau is restricted. Rich hydro, solar, and wind energy resources also exist on the plateau. Tibet is home to another form of environmentally sustainable energy called geothermal power. Originating at the fault lines of Earth's tectonic plates, geothermal power is difficult to harness, but has the potential to help offset our dependency on fossil fuels. The ecological balance of the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau and its wildlife are both protected. The government has also initiated expansive reforestation programs as well as created policies to protect deteriorating pastoral lands currently overgrazed due to the vast numbers of new Tibetan herders. Like all 55 minorities in China, Tibetans are not subject to the one-child policy as practiced by the majority Han Chinese. Since 1954, the Tibetan population has almost doubled from 2.8 million to 4.5 million. The average life expectancy has increased dramatically from about 35 years to 67 years today. The reasons for this spectacular improvement of life are many, but chief among them are Chinese government-supported programs for better nutrition, health care, housing, and education. The nine-year compulsory education requirement has all but wiped out illiteracy in Tibet, which before 1959 lingered around 95%. School children in remote rural farming and pastoral areas are entitled to free board, lodging, and tuition. The number of highly educated Tibetans continues to increase, representing a major force driving Tibet's socio-economic development. Currently, there are more than 14 Tibetan language periodicals and 10 newspapers available. Radio and TV broadcast around the clock the even remote areas of Tibet. The creation of a state-of-the-art infrastructure and communication system has led to an economic boom in Tibet. It also resulted in a considerable rise of earnings for farmers and herders, as well as higher disposable incomes for urban dwellers. Affordable housing and an extensive social safety net are also available. Tourism has greatly expanded, especially after the 2006 completion of the Qinghai Tibetan Railroad, which is the most important investment in China's Western development strategy. This train is a marvel of environmentally friendly engineering that had to cope with oxygen deficient, earthquake prone terrain along the ancient gateway to Tibet, the Tangula Pass, part of the majestic Kunlun mountain range. Eventually, this will become a trans-Himalaya railway system extending to Nepal and India. <coughs> Historic architecture is being protected and preserved. Major renovations and repairs of monasteries take care of these architectural treasures, which harmoniously combine Indian, Nepalese, and Chinese design. There are more than 1,780 monasteries and temples in Tibet with almost 50,000 resident monks and nuns. A unique artistic expression of the Tibetan culture is the Tonka. This is a religious painting done on fine linen or silk. Talented artists finely paint religious scenes using natural mineral and plant colors that are mixed with ox bile to retain their brilliance. Rare tankas, some of them so massive as to cover a hillside, 
are only shown during special monastic celebrations. For many Tibetans, small communal celebrations are the most important, such as this one we passed when traveling through rural Tibet. They bring villages together, and united, they pray for greater well-being. The vibrant Tibetan culture is colorful and entertaining, in stark contrast to the bleak and harsh landscape. Modern times have not only brought great social changes and dynamic economic progress to Tibet, but have also made Tibet's unique cultural legacy shine even brighter. Tibet is quite a different place than the utopia many Westerners have perceived it to be. The esoteric storybook image of this remote land is in sharp contrast to Tibet, both in the past and present. It may be difficult to imagine just how remote Tibet has been for the vast majority of its history. It is this with ill-purposed Western foreign policies that has created much of the misinformation of Tibet. The problem facing the region today is simply how to bring a population that has been isolated for many centuries into the fold of a contemporary society. On one side is an intricate web of progress-resistant age-old traditions and on the other is a modern way of life that has no choice but to deal with the complexities of the 21st century. Just as China is seeking to balance these issues, let us remember our world has become a global village. We depend on each other. We must understand and respect our diversity. The forces of history determine the future. Thank you.